Hello and welcome. Today I just want to talk a little bit and analyze a little bit of a sequence from the miniseries Jesus of Nazareth, directed by Franco Zeffirelli, starring the incomparable Robert Powell. Just look at some of this amazing direction that you're just seeing in the first few seconds. I think Franco Zeffirelli directed his butt off in this movie. I mean, he really tried to give a tremendous sense of... of biblical epicness to something that was made for TV, which is something you don't see a lot of. So going right into the sequence, you can see here that we're establishing the temple life and all of the selling of goods in the temple as a very much a part of everyday life, and you're almost caught in the midst of it as, as sort of like, yeah, this seems very everyday, doesn't it? And you kind of get used to it. But wait. somewhere else. Jerusalem, the faithful city, she that was full of justice, has become a harlot. See, it, 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 it actually lulls us into the moment so that when he goes ape and starts smashing stuff and throwing over tables, it kind of takes us off guard too. Remember, that would have been very shocking for the people in the temple on that day. It w uh, this just was not something that they would have expected at all to happen. This would have been like every other day at the temple. You wouldn't have expected this sort of this sort of craziness. And I mean, he reduces reduces everything to rubble. <laughs> What a powerful voice, huh? One of the things I love about Robert Powell is he can run the full emotional gambit of what Jesus would have had to actually be uh, interacting with. Now, ch check out this moment. You see this beautiful shot on the temple, on the Holy of Holies, where God himself lives, right? And then we see Jesus have this moment of absorbing that, kind of taking in, in awe, this is probably the closest that he has been to his father since departing his own kingdom. Pretty cool that they took this moment, whether it was written in the script or not, they took this moment to recognize that. Rabbi. My name is Zera. I'm a scribe of this holy place. And I, like my brethren, have followed your mission with great interest. We have heard good things of you and are glad. But what you have done here today both shocks and surprises us. Do you wish to destroy the sacred temple? The temple is not mere stone. It is the house of God. It cannot be destroyed as long as God lives here. Destroy this temple. And in three days, I will make it rise again. Now wait. This is in almost every version of the story of Jesus. But I love the way they play this moment specifically. Do you think you can rebuild it in three days? You have said it. But you have not understood. Because of course Jesus was talking about himself, but check this out. Rabbi, I understand better than you think. That's such good visual storytelling. Because what just happened there was purely through visual purely through visuals, through nothing else, we established the socio-economic and political ramifications of what a revolt from the Jews would mean. And that is exactly what the Pharisees and Sadducees think is going to happen. They think that Jesus is going to lead a revolt. And so when, he, when he's looking up and sees the Roman guards, it says... With no dialogue, no Christopher Nolan monologue about how, how this will affect our daily life. Instead, through just a simple moment, he understands, Oh, I think I, I get it. 
what you're talking about is if we lead a revolt and it destroys our, our way of life. That is very, very brilliant storytelling. And again, I don't know if it was in the script. Maybe they added it. Uh, or it just sort of like that same little moment where Jesus is staring up at the Holy of Holies. Maybe it was all added in. Maybe it was written in the script. I don't know. But either way, whoever came up with that idea, goodness, I mean, that's some, that's some powerful stuff. There was both beautiful locations used and beautiful sets built for this. And uh, you can just see the production value. And you may recognize uh, our Mother Mary there as being played by Juliet from Frank Franco Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet. And I think I said before in my Biblical Epics Top 10 video that there was something about seeing her in this role that she she is very good in the role, but there's just something about her acting that she carries over from Romeo and Juliet that still makes Mary a little bit of a, too much of a romantic character for me personally. For he who would be great among you must be your servant. He who would be the first... Robert Powell just has the perfect delivery for these lines. He really speaks them not as somebody who is preaching at you, which some actors treat Jesus as he, as a uh, somebody who's just preaching, but Robert Powell, he shows Jesus as a person who is trying desperately to get you to understand. Trying... And he really, in some cases, he sounds desperate to make people understand that moment that's coming up in just a minute, uh, which is the reason why I actually wanted to do this video, which involves Barabbas. And it's, it's so well done because Jesus desperately wants to reach him. He does not want him to do what he's going to do. of the world. Well, I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was a prisoner, and you visited me. I was sick, and you came to me. He just really gets it. And, I mean, there's just a few actors. Jim Caviezel in The Passion is one of them who really gets the weight of these lines, of what they meant, of what they meant for human history. Because compassion and kindness, they're not part of our normal human evolution. They are things that we have decided to prize above all other things, despite the fact that it openly contradicts the way we evolved as creatures. There really is no justification for accepting it beyond the fact that it's it's the right thing to do. It really comes down to right and wrong. And, and uh, you know, there's, we have no obligation to be kind to others. It doesn't, it doesn't always help us get along, in fact. Sometimes it's easier. Sometimes it, it seems better to do exactly what Barabbas thinks about doing, and I think this is one of the reasons why this is politically very relevant for this time period. Uh, and by the way, I'm not talking about either side in, in specific. Both sides need to learn the lesson that this movie is talking about. So, here it comes. A great addition. Oh, that guy's wearing a Hershey's Kiss hat. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I'm really easily distracted. <laughs> so this... <laughs> that just struck me really funny. Um, so, in this version, Barabbas actually comes to Jesus to talk to him before their trial, before either of them have been arrested. Now, what is grand about this is that it sets up for the real meaning of Barabbas or, Ju uh, uh, or Jesus. Which one are you going to choose? It sets up for the real meaning that the Jews of the time reading the gospel would have understood, but we miss. We're just too far removed from it. 
But this gets it. He said to trust you. My brothers are ready. Some of them are temple guards. Our day of revenge against the Romans has come. Every day their grip becomes tighter. Our people have grown used to oppression. But with you to lead them, and with our swords behind you, they will rise up. We can teach them to fight. Some of the priests and Sadducees have said, obey the laws of Caesar. They do not speak for the Jewish people. Tell us what to do. Whatever you say will follow you. And love your enemies. And forgive those who use and persecute you. The day of forgiveness is at hand. Forgive Herod? Forgive the Romans? Forgive them all. But the, the Romans have butchered hundreds of innocent people, young people, old people, lives ended without mercy, without trial. Surely you, you, you can't mean to forgive that, Master. We must meet the sword with the sword. All who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. But we must end the voice of weeping in Israel. Barabbas, your zeal blinds you to the truth. The new Jerusalem will not be built by murder and uprisings. The wisdom of God will fill the land as water. Now, see? This is so brilliant because what it does is lay out the two different types of Messiah that they would have viewed at the time. So, the Messiah who comes to forgive sins and give people a new way of life, or the Messiah who tears everything down, burn it to the ground, so to speak. While we wait for that day to come, our people live in mourning and lamentation. And see how Jesus' face kind of falls, and it's because both of them are making great points. And it is hard to accept the suffering of the temporary for the good of the long term. My shoulders the sins of the world. He who would follow me must do the same. Oh, no. He won't do it. And Barabbas. Jesus still again, almost desperately at times, comes, tries to pursue these people. And, I mean, man, in just two shots, again, visual storytelling at its finest, you get that Jesus is, is watching him go, thinking, you can't imagine the place in history that you just chose for yourself. I don't want that for you. Please, come to your senses. Don't go trying to start a revolt. <laughs> And again, I think that's politically so relevant because it seems to me like every year we get more violence and that's from both sides of the political spectrum. And I think that a lot of the time, as Jesus said, your zealotry can blind you to the truth. And I just think that this is just a little example of how the story of Jesus is more relevant now than maybe that it's ever been. The idea of loving your enemy and trying to understand them and understand where they're coming from rather than hatred, hating each other. Nobody becomes better, nobody becomes wiser, nobody becomes stronger through hatred. Hatred is weak and it makes you weak. And that's why I personally... I, I get, I'm sick of hating. I'm sick of hating and wishing ill on, on the people that I disagree with. And I hope that you are too. And that maybe going forward into 2021, we can see some love and some understanding between people. And I think that that, again, goes for both sides of every argument. We need to just take the time to understand each other, to love each other. Because in the end, I don't think that one half of the population is evil. I think we just all have different ideas. And if we can get back to a place of loving and acceptance where we can 
argue those ideas in a reasonable way, we'll all be better off for it. And whatever things are like now, in the future, they can be better. <laughs>